This video is freeware, so you can use it as you wish. Gaddafi arrested. Yahoo! One other thing to look at as we look at the comparisons, we look at comparisons between Egypt and Israel at the time during the war. We also need to draw comparisons or draw um, relations, uh, relationships between Egypt, Israel, and the United States because a lot of what happens in the Arab-Israeli war directly impacts on uh, U.S. doctrine at the time. General Depew in our Leavenworth paper uh, number 16 here, uh, he talks about the impact that the Arab-Israeli war has on our doctrine and how we look at maneuver, how we look at logistics, how we look at uh, audacity, uh, that's and those a, things. That's an excellent point. Uh, we do have some readings for this week from the, uh, the Depew book, uh, and it will constitute the bulk of the readings for Lesson 16 next week. Uh, so I try to use that as a bridge from wrapping up this week's lesson and getting ready for next week's lesson. But yes, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And it brings me to my final thing to consider is you could have one student give an overall summary of what's in this book and, and then open up to discussion. Did we draw the right kinds of lessons as we looked at this war? And it'll be a nice bridge. So you can now add a third possible briefing for a student in addition to one on the 8th of October battle, one on the Chinese farm and Israeli countercrossing, and then add this one. The other thing that's kind of interesting you might keep in mind, as uh, Dr. Lewis has mentioned, if you have some students who have some background experiences with Israeli and Egyptian military, you might find that they think that what they see today reflects back at what was going on in 73, and you might explore that issue. Are the armies uh, the same today as they were before? Can we make jumps back into the past that easily? Okay, the next thing I think that it would be good to look at is uh, the background to this war, that whole issue. Um, I think as you look at uh, teaching history, there are certain kinds of questions that you can ask that are of broader nature and then use a particular historical example to highlight those broader issues. As I look at the 67 to 73 time frame, one question you could ask, it's a phrase that you often hear mentioned in the military, what does it mean to refight the last war? Are the Israelis preparing to fight the last war? And as I look at the 73 war and how the Israelis prepared for it based on their 67 experience, there are three broad issues that you might consider that armies might be doing, at least in the Israelis were doing, when they're preparing to refight the last war. Do they expect the enemy to perform the same way that he did last time? Are they prepared for a different kind of enemy? If you notice in the LP, there are several places in this war where senior Israeli generals are saying, this is not the army of 67. They expected it to perform pretty much the same way as it did in 67. All the kinds of problems they had that led to disaster. The second kind of thing uh, armies that are preparing to refight the last war might be doing is, they think it's going to be the same kind of dynamic in the war. Israelis were thinking the next war is going to be short, it's going to be decisive, and we're going to have few casualties. They did not expect for a war of attrition that was going to draw out to be three weeks. For them, three weeks was a long time if you think of a nation of three million people trying to fight that long. So sometimes nations, when they're preparing to refight the last war, might be expecting the enemy to perform the same way and expect the dynamic of the conflict to be pretty much the same as it was last time. And the third thing that the Israelis, I think, are doing that is kind of refighting the last war is they are relying on the same keys to success. Those are, they're going to have prior intelligence that the war is going to break out, that intelligence is going to be accurate, timely, and useful. The second thing is they're going to be able to use their air power to a maximum be able to have air superiority, and they're not able to do that because the war starts out with the Arabs attacking, and then you have to face the dilemma. What happens when the enemy starts the war and you have to fight, and you've been used to fighting with you starting the war, as in 56 and 67? And the final thing, the key success, is that on the ground, the key will be armor. And armor is going to be able to break through easily and uh, bring decision on the battlefield. And you find that armor does not perform the way it's supposed to because the Arabs have attacked and they have 
counter each of those kinds of strengths that the Israelis have. When you put them all together, there is a parallel to our army situation. We expect to win the information war, we expect to have air superiority, and we expect to have the superiority and maneuver. Who would want to go against an army with those strengths? Well, the Arabs have to face those strengths as they develop a strategy out of desperation, if you will, on both sides, Syria and Egypt. Something that's important uh, that, George, you've kind of highlighted on is that the enemy always has a vote. Uh, if we all, if we forget that, and many times we do, uh, it's going to be to our detriment. Right. Uh, always count on the enemy having a vote, no matter what the situation is, whether it's good for you or bad for you. Uh, there, there are those things that uh, that the opponent can do uh, that's going to influence what your plans are uh, and what your operations are going to be. Okay. Uh, this ties in with an approach that I have used uh, in the classroom regarding the preparation for the future conflict. Uh, what we have here is a mindset that exists within the Israeli military, uh, which today the American military labels complacency. Complacency is an issue that you can explore because it has to do with you, you establish conditions that you become so comfortable with that you do not see things change around you. And that commanders, in order to understand the situation, need to constantly reevaluate the situation uh, for what is both consistent and what is changing. We, we can see in the Egyptian army that at the strategic, operational, tactical level, they have reevaluated the situation based upon the 1967 conflict. And then the political leadership is trying to emphasize a point, which George will get to, I believe, also, uh, uh, that is achievable. Something that is well within the capabilities of the Egyptian military at the time. That is something that we try to stress with the students is that when the plans become so ornate and so grandiose that they're not achievable within your own capabilities, then what are your chances of success? Uh, the key then is to establish something that, that even in a limited conflict is achievable within a certain timeline with the resources at hand and from there, if you're going to use the military instrument of power to achieve your political ends, then the military itself has the capability to win and not fail. And that is something that we try to drive home here. I think the going along with what uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kretschik has said, I think then you could look at what are the strategies that the Arabs are employing, Syria and Egypt. And in that to generate discussion, you could go into the LP and look at those long interviews or quotes that come in about how the Egyptians are thinking they will fight against the Israelis at the strategic level. We have a long quote of Haikal. They're not talking about a decisive military victory, but they're talking about changing America's attitude toward the Middle East and toward Egypt, changing Israel's attitude toward the Arabs. How did they go about doing that? And then look at the interview that Sadat uh, conducts in Newsweek in April of 1973. What is he saying there? What message is he trying to do there? Why is he going to the public in America, to the policymakers, and presenting himself to them and basically telling what he will be trying to do in the war? And that should generate some discussion. And I think then the beauty of it is, as Colonel Kretschik has said, we've got a situation where the opponent cannot decisively defeat, uh, the person cannot defeat, or I should say, his opponent. How is he going to counter that? He has to develop a strategy that is going to bring some political benefits to him. And he also has to use the military to counter the strengths that the opponent has. And that gets into air defense, that gets into the anti-tank missiles used by infantry, and that gets into deception to undermine Israeli intelligence and its ability to predict the war too far in advance. So you might explore then, what is the strategy that's being developed? Because I think in the future, if someone is forced to fight us, they're not going to be thinking of defeating us decisively on the battlefield. They're probably not going to be thinking of t capturing decisive terrain. What they might be trying to do is hurt us enough that after the war is over, we'll look at that region and that particular player differently. And they've gained politically that way because they still will survive in power, most likely, if it's a dictator. 
one of our colleagues uh, came up with uh, with an idea several years ago of simply walking in and asking who won this war and then once the responses start coming in why uh, it's it sounds very simplistic but as a rule you'll find there will be officers in every group usually divided down the middle with half thinking that the Israelis won the war and half thinking that the Arabs won the war uh, that's the basis for a healthy discussion of warfare at the strategic level operational level and tactical level uh, your job as a facilitator is to control that discussion but theoretically it can be done by asking one very good question absolutely and what that does uh, what dr lewis is saying is it reverses the whole order rather than looking at background to more conventional way conduct of war and then the results start with the results and then have them defend their position well what were the objectives in this war for each side were they attained how was the war conducted did it affect the overall strategic situation at the end in determining whether they can obtain their objectives because you have to remember just by crossing the canal is not enough for the Arabs if they get decisively defeated and their whole army gets pulverized it leaves them in a different bargaining position strategically at the end of the war they are left compromised at the end of the war because their third army basically first echelon two reinforced divisions is surrounded on the east bank so that's the position from which Saddam has to start negotiating rather than I've crossed all my positions are secure now negotiate with me so it brings it back it puts more pressure I think on you as the instructor to ask the right kinds of questions that will force people to provide evidence why do they believe one side one or the other or if they say both why and what degree at what levels but certainly Egypt gets back to Sinai but at the same time its military image is not that good it's only good for the first part of the war in the crossing operation. Israel comes out looking good because they've done the bold, audacious counter crossing, got into the Israeli rear. So that is a good way of doing it. I would like to uh, add one point on that. This gets into a, a previous lesson with uh, Karl Clausewitz and his notion of using military instrument to achieve uh, political objectives. It is an interesting dynamic to bring out with your students when they begin to first realize, uh, some of them for the very first time, that, that why a military is used. Uh, some students uh, believe that militaries are used to go out on the battlefield and do certain things uh, to fight and win wars uh, for their nation state. Some uh, are also educated now to the point where they realize that maybe it's not just the nation state that the military was used for but for a key political leader to accomplish that individual's goals and objectives and then while the war is being conducted Clausewitz noted that you can never push war to its extremes because of the limitations that are placed upon the military commander that come from all sectors of the society that, that spawn that military plus also the political dynamics that are ongoing while the conflict is being fought which reinforces I think George's point that if that military commander is, is not successful on the battlefield in accomplishing the ends then what situation does that place the political leader in where he now has to bargain rather from a position of strength like he envisioned but a position of vulnerability so that should be emphasized I think with the students that they as military commanders play a key role how they maneuver their forces how they fight those forces how many casualties they cause on the enemy or take themselves how they use the equipment at hand to achieve national ends because no matter how that conflict ends they were the ones who may have fought that conflict but it is going to be the political leadership that has to pick up the pieces at the end and then negotiate or bargain to achieve the military end state and the political end state that's a very good point I was going to go a slightly different way with the conduct of the war but to take off on what Colonel Kretschik said as this war is being conducted you could look at these things tactically and operationally but also politics plays a role in this and it affects how you conduct operations for example when Israel is doing its counter-crossing operation and starting to become see perhaps also
Evidence, 24th April 2005. After the first and the second contact, see, it is possible, these videos. Only 22 days passed. And then, 